<laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, welcome to my presentation. Glad that so many came and are interested in ML Ops. I uh, appreciate that you didn't read out the title because it's actually a lot of stuff in there, I, th I guess. And you probably all wonder what this talk is going to be about. And I hope to clarify this a little bit more during my talk. So uh, it's called Maximizing Efficiency and Scalability in Open Source ML Ops. And um, yeah, what this is all about and what efficiency and scalability are and how you can use them for ML Ops, uh, that's what basically I want to um, yeah, explain to you today. So I want to kick things off with, uh, with a um, plot or with a graphic uh, that came out already in 2015 in a paper called Hidden Depth in uh, Machine Learning Systems. So I just ask all of you who knows this and who has already seen this plot before. Okay, it seems like, I would say half. Um, yeah, it's, I, to me it's a very seminal paper, which is uh, already eight years old now. And basically the point that the authors uh, at that time made was that um, if you want to put machine learning into production, um, there's actually very little component that is only about machine learning. So you see this small little dot, this black box in there, that's your ML code. And then there's basically 95% or of stuff that you have to build around it. And that's basically, um, yeah, so one of the big challenges uh, since then, and I think this challenge still exists, and it's basically all about how to put machine learning into production. Uh, just to give you some context, what, uh, like from, from which perspective I'm looking at uh, MLOps, um, I want to quickly introduce myself and um, my company. So a few words about me. Uh, I'm Paul. Uh, I studied uh, systematic musicology and uh, did a doctor fill in this domain. Um, I did a lot of uh, cognitive uh, studies in uh, musicology and uh, so at the intersection of cognitive sciences and, and music, which was very interesting, but at some point I decided to move into data science. Uh, I worked at, as a data scientist uh, in some in-house positions. Uh, then later moved to AI consulting or in data science consulting, and I'm currently uh, leading the AI and data science team at Data Drivers. And uh, we are a small, small-ish uh, consulting company uh, based in Hamburg, Germany, um, which is pretty much one and a half hour train ride from Berlin, uh, and the second biggest city in Germany, if you don't know much about Hamburg. Uh, we were founded in 2015. Um, uh, and um, based in Hamburg, and we have around 40 um, people working here. And we do a bunch of stuff, mostly about building um, data platforms in the cloud uh, for various um, yeah, clients. And to show you some of the clients we have been working with, um, you, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably familiar with uh, at least some of them. Um, and what is interesting if you work in IT consulting and uh, particularly if you work in uh, something that is, uh, has to do with data science consulting and also AI or machine learning consulting is uh, that you basically face uh, uh, the, the challenge of building an ML production system uh, for like very um, different uh, kind of setups. So basically every client has their own history, every client has their own data. Uh, their own IT system, their own IT infrastructure. So um, you basically learn a lot and you see many different things and also uh, the way of how you build out the machine learning system that you want to run into production can be different, of course, because you should try to adapt this to the client needs. And uh, what this means for us is that it's basically a very good um, way of also trying to abstract what kind of things matter and what is valuable and also um, sometimes some very uh, uh, um, tedious and um, uh, heavy learnings that we had to take when building ML production systems. So I'm trying to build on this, on our experience, what we have seen so far and try to give you some of these um, uh, experiences in this talk. So basically what can you expect from this? Uh, a very opinionated take on ML ops based on our experience. Um, and I want to kick this discussion off with basically uh, a statement that I'm going to try to convince you of, uh, and this is the following. 
So I assume that your MLOps problem is not so much a technical problem, but it's more an organizational problem. Uh, there was a blog post which I kind of came across very recently by Costas Padales, um, who, claimed, uh, who claims that MLOps is 98% data engineering. I thought, that's a bummer. I'm a data scientist uh, trying to do MLOps, or like at least I was kind of a data scientist, um, and now I'm told that uh, I'm actually not the right guy, and uh, this can all be achieved by data engineers. But uh, when you read through this blog post, uh, you actually are kind of convinced, I would say. At least I was kind of convinced. So there are many things uh, uh, that you have to tackle. Uh, if you remember, like this um, uh, Google uh, uh, plot with all these boxes, uh, a lot of these components have been already there. So for instance, uh, things like data and pipeline management, infrastructure management, Deploying and monitoring applications, all of this has been there before, before people were trying to put machine learning into production. And um, people called data engineers or maybe software engineers, backend engineers, whatever you call them, they have been dealing with these kinds of pro uh, problems for a very long time and there are many um, standard ways of how to do this. But obviously um, there, is these, there are these remaining 2% um, that are somehow important. So obviously you also need to understand machine learning and data science, and it's a lot more complex than just calling uh, fit and predict on, uh, on a model. Uh, and if you don't like understand the logic behind the models, then obviously you are also kind of lost. Uh, and not even to mention the business case that you all, always also need to take into account. Um, for instance, if you think uh, about monitoring, uh, monitoring the, the relevant uh, business KPIs for your model is very important, and this has to do with your machine learning application and also with the business case you're trying to solve. Um, but I think the main point here is that whatever the composition of skills uh, are, the skills are available. So I think in most data teams, uh, at least in, in many data teams that I have uh, seen and in many companies, uh, you have people who know a lot and who have different skill sets, um, but it is all a matter of, of combining these uh, skill sets uh, very efficiently, and um, that's going to help you a lot. And I think another point uh, to consider here is that um, we don't need more tools. Actually, there is an abundance of tools already available. Uh, so if you look at this, <coughs> this is uh, um, a plot. It's bit hard to read, but I can just uh, like give you, uh, I can just read it out. Uh, so um, this is th from um, a blog um, by Chip Huen, uh, who is uh, um, a professor at Stanford, or uh, at least lecturer. Uh, and she, um, she basically did a survey on, uh, on the ML tooling landscape, and this is from 2020. So this is already like light years old in machine learning uh, time. But uh, already since then, she, she uh, co collected more than 284 different tools for things like data pipeline, infrastructure, serving, all-in-one solution, hardware, model training. So basically all the components uh, that are out there, um, basically you can find tools. And if you want, um, you can like look for her blog and uh, she has a list. She have, even has a, a Google sheet with uh, all the tools available. So I think like um, it's not so matter much. Uh, it's not so much a matter of like finding um, like that there is a tool missing in your tool stack. It's more a question of um, uh, not using the wrong tool for the wrong job. And so basically, uh, what what do you need to do? Um, obviously, you need to get your skills and tools organized. And how can you do this with efficiency and scalability? So now you might wonder, what are these things then, efficiency and scalability, and how can they help you? And um, I think, like, um, to start with efficiency, uh, you can think of these things as kind of design principles, or maybe even some kind of meta design principles that you can use to make informed decisions. Uh, so we know efficiency already from systems design, 
where we basically try, for instance, when we try to uh, uh, implement an algorithm. So we want this algorithm to be as efficient as possible. So it, could, it could be like a sorting algorithm, but it could also be a machine learning algorithm. So you want this to use very, uh, very little resources. You want, to be this, uh, you want this to be fast, and so on. You can also think, think of efficiency in the systems design perspective in terms of data structures. So for instance, um, uh, yesterday uh, I heard a talk, talk about uh, the Spark Connect uh, um, uh, component. So, and there were RDDs mentioned. RDD is like a perfect example for a very, um, for, for a, a data structure that is like very um, uh, narrowed down to a, a very proprietary data structure, basically to make things more efficient. And then you can also, also think of efficiency in terms of parallelizing your work. Um, but I think for MLOps, efficiency also has another meaning that is very Im important, and that's basically the efficiency of the data science developer. So uh, usually a data scientist wants to be very quick. Uh, they, they want to try out things very quickly and see if something works or not. And um, usually our work mode as a data scientist is not by um, having like very deterministic assumptions and then you know what to build, but uh, you have to try out many things. You have to experiment with your features, uh, with your data, with your transformations. Uh, and uh, if you have high iteration speed and high experimentation velocity, this is actually gonna um, uh, matter a lot for how successful your whole uh, ML project will be. Um, so to put this even a little bit more bluntly, one very uh, um, efficient system could be the Kaggle data scientist. Uh, you probably heard uh, of Kaggle um, all, I guess. Uh, so um, like a data scientist who's working uh, on a Kaggle problem has a very well-defined business problem, uh, has very well-defined uh, data sources. Uh, you can just download your data from Kaggle uh, as a CSV file and then basically work on your local machine and iterate very quickly on your own in your Jupyter Notebook or IDE, and you can make very rapid progress in the way how you solve this data science problem. Uh, and uh, you can also see it in the results of these Kaggle competitions that people are usually uh, like, um, the benchmarks are very high and it's very hard to beat each other and very close race. Um, but obviously, um, there's, or there's also another twist to efficiency that you can put into the picture. Uh, so you can also think of maintainability as being a feature of efficiency. Uh, so for instance, um, if you build something and uh, then you need to change something, you uh, want this code that you have previously de developed to be maintainable. And the Kaggle data scientist probably has a hard time to, um, I don't know, hand over his, the, uh, the notebook to another person uh, or to maintain the code that he um, has been writing. And uh, maintainability is also uh, antagonistic to many other design principles. So obviously that's no, not the only thing that counts to be rapid, to be efficient, uh, but there are other design principles that you might want to consider when building a product. And these uh, are sometimes antagonistic to this idea of being very efficient. So if you think of robustness, of the robustness of your system, uh, you don't want uh, things to be, um, uh, you, you want to, uh, to, be, to be sure that things are deployed in the same way. You want uh, your code to be uh, tested before you deploy it. So these are also things that will, in the end, um, kind of be relevant for your system, but are somehow like slowing you down in your development speed. Okay, so that's about efficiency. Now let's switch to scalability. Here we also have a notion that we kind of know from systems design. So we have perhaps like some things like uh, horizontal and vert vertical scalability in terms of compute resources. So you can basically scale your system by adding more resources for some kind of task, or you can make your resources um, bigger. Um, but also here, I think we can make a twist to it and uh, adapt this to the MLOps sphere. And I think what here is most important is that uh, scalability uh, in terms of MLOps uh, has to do with organizational scalability. 
and the possibility uh, to share knowledge across users and roles. So for instance, it's also very important that you uh, not only enable other data scientists to collaborate with you on your data science problem, but also make your work in a way shareable with people who have other roles, for instance, like data engineers or uh, cloud engineers who help you by uh, deploying um, the solutions or who you are collaborating with on your MLOps problem. And um, yeah, then also a few things that, um, that also matter here are, are also um, things like automation, validation, and versioning. So uh, these will all um, uh, factor in or like um, uh, help you with, uh, with scaling things. So uh, automating tasks, making them less, um, like making work less redundant is obviously helping you in scaling your system uh, validating data and um, uh, like early on and validating your system is also very important and versioning will help you as well. So um, efficiency and scalability uh, can be thought of as some kind of um, design principles uh, that you can think of that are important and they are somehow like moving into different directions I would say. Um, but they can help you make decisions. So now you might wonder, what is he talking about and how this can actually help? So, and uh, I will try to make this a little bit more um, clear in the next section, um, where we are actually talking a little bit more about tools and uh, evaluating tools. So first of all, like this is kind of the thing that we at Data Drivers believe in. So we think that um, like for Perhaps 90% of uh, ML systems, the best solution is to combine open source, source software with cloud platform services. Um, I could probably like give another talk on why this is the case. So for now, I will just leave it like that. Um, but um, what I want to do is just to pick out a few of the open source components that we think are very important and that will kind of nicely add up to uh, um, some cloud managed services that we are also using. Okay, let's start with the first one, MLflow. Uh, I guess some of you have already been working with MLflow or perhaps some of you are, are using this uh, on a regular basis. We think this is a very, very uh, uh, good tool. Obviously there are other alternatives to MLflow, but uh, we uh, stick with MLflow because it's open source. You can deploy it uh, in your own cloud environment uh, and you can do a lot of stuff with it. And why is it good? So it is an experiment tracking tool. It basically allows you to compare different um, experiment runs uh, for your um, machine learning application. So you can compare, for instance, uh, different sets of features. You can compare um, different hyperparameter tunings, or you can even compare um, yeah, training different models uh, against uh, and compare these um, experimentation runs against each other and then basically decide which um, results are best and which you want to uh, then later put into production. Uh, but it also, it also um, provides you a model registry and it is a very cool collaboration tool. Uh, and now our friends efficiency and scalability can come in handy because we can now think, okay, is MLOps something interesting? Uh, and I would say yes, because it will basically enhance our efficiency. So it will allow us to be better at experimentation. It will uh, increase velocity because of this experimentation tracking component. And it will also help to scale us. So it will also help us to be better at collaboration with each other, because we can basically uh, for instance, uh, see what other people are doing. Uh, we can, like, uh, we have different com uh, contributors who can, um, like, um, submit their experiments uh, for the same problem, and we can compare them. So it basically um, provides uh, um, a benefit for for these two components. Um, yeah, just to mention one more aspect. So what I really like about MLflow is uh, the, the, the tracking is nice and the experimentation, but what I really like are these two later components, uh, MLflow models and the model registry, because uh, this is uh, going already like a step beyond just experimentation tracking, where you have functionality of basically also um, reviewing what kind of model you want to put into production based on your experiment runs. 
so this is sometimes referred to as the data science pull request or data science merge request. And it goes a lot into this direction of uh, deploying models is different from deploying code because you basically <coughs> want to look at um, um, visualizations, you want to compare metrics, and it's, it's, it's just different. And MLflow um, allows this to do, to, allows to do this. And then another tool that we almost always use uh, is Terraform. So Terraform helps us to um, deploy infrastructure as code, um, or to have our infrastructure as code and deploy this via um, Terraform. Uh, it allows us to scale resources and also to um, be able to um, deploy this in, in various cloud settings. So for instance, uh, it also helps you against like vendor lock-in effects. This obviously, again, is not so much contributing to your efficiency um, because uh, it will make things more complicated and more complex, uh, but it allows you a lot more scalability in terms of how you can um, like add resources or you can also like uh, scale out to, I don't know, different cloud environments, for instance. And then the last tool I want to mention is Feast, uh, which we also really like. Uh, so Feast is a feature store. It's uh, also open source. Um, and um, it has, um, I think, two features that contribute a lot to scalability. And that's like the, the one re uh, thing is that it, uh, it allows you to scale to real-time serving. So it makes it easier, at least, uh, to go from, from batch uh, prediction jobs to streaming uh, jobs. And um, what I also really like about it is that it basically allows you to scale features across teams. And uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about what that means. So um, Feast is also considered to be like a, a, a feature store version three or whatever you call it. So it has kind of a, um, a register for your features. And I, I really like this register part about it because um, similar to kind of a data catalog that you perhaps might have come across, uh, it allows you to um, store and register features and uh, especially if you want to scale out your um, machine learning system to kind of a, uh, like, like to, to like collaborate it with many teams or across uh, different data science use cases, you can basically share the same feature, the same kind of transformation that you want to apply to data with many other data teams. So for instance, if you work on one use case and you basically implement a feature for this use case, and then you, I don't know, start another project and you want to reuse this feature, uh, Feast makes this a lot easier and will also help you kind of uh, reduce uh, a boilerplate and redundant code. Yes, so in the end, um, I think um, MLOps is still hard and even like having seen many things and trying to put many uh, machine learning models in production, uh, I can say it's still very hard and difficult. And I think one of the reasons for why it is so hard is because we have all these contradicting uh, design principles. So we want to be very quick in our experimentation, but also we want to make sure it's robust. Uh, and um, yeah, this is hard to handle. But I hope that I at least uh, kind of convinced you uh, that efficiency and scalability may help you to solve the organizational burden of MLOps uh, because they can be used as a guideline for tool selection. Yeah, so with that, um, I can just say there is no single best approach to MLOps, and I think finding your own way and finding what works best for you is like the, the way to go. And um, I hope like using uh, or thinking of design principles and finding your way uh, may help you uh, deploy all your models into production. So thank you and good luck with your MLOps journey. Thank you, Paul. Nice overview of uh, machine learning production and MLOps. Um, we have some questions on the Slido, and you can put them on Slido still. Uh, if you cannot see them to upvote, I'm sorry, because I'm up approving everything. So um, put them, try to vote, and I'm going to ask sure. the questions to Paul. So do you have a feeling that there is a serious fear of missing out in MLOps space? 
and in reality, people do not need most of those tools at all. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like um, I, I gave a, another talk on MLOps where I basically said, uh, um, like, um, beware of the model zoo. Uh, and I think that's very true because uh, it can be very overwhelming. You see all these new tools uh, popping up and you quickly have to decide whether or not this is something that is important or relevant for you and this can be very challenging. And I mean, what we try to do is basically stick to as much, s to build things as simple as possible and to use as little tools as possible and to be very like um, <coughs> thoughtful about putting some new model into our system. Nice, you don't want to be changing uh, everyday tools and so on. That's not so nice. Yeah. So there is a question about cloud provider. Uh, which one are you using? Uh, and um, which service are you using to deploy yes. MLflow? Okay, yeah, good point. Yeah, I didn't mention cloud services. So uh, we mostly work on uh, GCP and AWS. Um, and we are using both uh, SageMaker and Vertex AI. Uh, my feeling is that uh, GCP is like the services, I like them a little bit better for machine learning and for MLOps. So like if you have to make the decision, I would probably go with GCP right now. Okay, nice. Uh, managed service is uh, good to end. Um, next question, what is your recommendation for model serving with Terra Terraform? I haven't served models with Terraform. Usually we only serve infrastructure and the models are served separately. Yeah. Yes, it's more for deploying infrastructure with the code. And next one, what kind of interfaces do you define between teams, like MLflow artifacts or? What kind of what? Interfaces. Between, between teams. Uh, that really depends on, uh, I guess, the project. So like, and I'm also struggling if I get the question right. So I don't think we have interface between teams or if it's like, the, the deployment? I think like we, you can use, um, um, let's say, uh, models as, as artifacts between the uh, training part and the serving part, or yeah, something yeah, like usually, that. yeah, usually. So we have usually we have like uh, 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 Docker images for the models, uh, and then basically, uh, but the model artifacts themselves we deploy then via um, either um, MLflow or sometimes we even use like uh, SageMaker model registry and stuff like that. Okay, there is a couple of questions about uh, data tracking and versioning. Mm -hmm. What are you using? So um, sometimes we've just built stuff kind of by hand uh, using also cloud managed services. Uh, we've been looking into DVC, which looks very good. Um, so yeah, so that's probably my recommendation, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, true. Um, there are a lot of bunch of flows, kubeflow, metaflow, mm -hmm. mlflow, and so on. But how would you go on about selecting a specific one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think these flows are a lot very different from each other. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, like kubeflow is nice, but um, I think especially for teams who are not yet using Kubernetes, I wouldn't like advise to just if you want to solve uh, MLOps to go into Kubernetes because it's just too hard to manage. Uh, so you can use uh, Kubeflow on GCP, which is good. Um, but if you're using uh, Kubernetes, then Kubeflow is obviously a good alternative. Yeah, on top of it. And have you used Fist within Databricks? If so, how does it compare to Databricks built-in feature store? Oh, that's a good question. No, I, I don't have any experience with uh, Databricks. Okay, um, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm picking the last questions. Um, how do you choose between using features from the cloud provider, uh, like the serving, mm -hmm. tracking, and so on, and using open source uh, tools? That's a really good question. I think that's becoming more and more difficult because uh, cloud providers are like more and more trying to um, uh, integrate functionality from open source tooling. So if you look at uh, what Google has been doing in the last, I don't know, year or something, they have like a lot, improved a lot. So they ha you can also find like uh, experimentation tracking system kind of, and you have, you have a model registry 
So, um, so that's that's a really difficult decision. I would, I think, the main benefit of using managed services is obviously that you don't have to manage them, and I would, that's a huge advantage, and I would always kind of use this in in doubt. So, like, my advice would be to use open source only when you really need it. And maybe when you don't have the skills to manage by yourself. Exactly, yeah, obviously, yeah. If you have skills to manage all this by yourself, then go for it. Okay, based on your ranking, you seem to have optimized for scalability. Mm -hmm. Was this a conscious choice? Um, I mean, kind of, like, I think like after every project and every model that you want to deploy, you would, you have like the feeling that you next time you will do something different. <laughs> you take some learning out of it. So I think for now we are like leaning more to scalability, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean there are other people who are like using notebooks in production, which is actually a lot more towards efficiency. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we don't do this. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you for the, your Thanks. sharing your experience. <laughs>